And I will read through all of Mark. So we're going on a journey. Um, and uh, yeah, just enjoy seeing Jesus as he goes along and the things that he does. Um, and then John uh, will come up after the reading and talk to us about what we've read. Okay, so Mark chapter 6, starting verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few people who were ill and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed with oil many people who were ill and healed them. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had, and he had bound and put him in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and a holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughters of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you, up to half my kingdom." She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once, the girl hurried in to the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a dish. The king was greatly distressed. But because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a dish. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. 
So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus told them to make all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. And soon, as they got out of the boat, the people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried those who were ill on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed those who were ill in the marketplaces. They begged him to let, to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Right. Thanks to Annika for reading that so beautifully. That was really well read. Um, and I guess the question is, why did I ask for that whole passage to be read? And if, uh, Andrew, you want me to put up the slides, please? So apparently that whole passage is a very tasty sandwich. So I'll try and explain to you why and how, okay? But, um, but yeah, I preached on uh, chapter three a few weeks ago and uh, I, think, I think it was Sam that said to me, John, that was a bit of a hospital pass of a passage, that one, in sporting terms. That's a tough, someone's giving you a tough job to do. And Chris is on holiday today and I think today is even more of a hospital pass than Chris. That I'm supposed to be preaching on John the Baptist and being beheaded in the middle of all these stories of Jesus going around and doing miracles and sending his disciples around and all kinds of weird stuff happening. So I'm like, thanks, Chris. This is going to be really easy. Um, so there's a reason why I've gone out to the whole passage, because this passage doesn't actually make sense, and it's deliberately not supposed to make sense within the context of where it is, because it's going to make us ask some really difficult questions. So be confused, but like me, use that confusion to sort of try and dig in. So I'll, I'll pray. And then we can um, look at that sandwich and particularly look at the filling bit in the middle, which is this weird story. Um, Father God, we thank you that your word is um, full of truth and life. And uh, this passage today, Mark 6, is just a work of I don't know, genius. Um, and uh, there's so much in it. And I pray, Lord, you help me to help each of us understand a little bit more about it and therefore to know you better and to do your mission. Amen. Okay, right, so first slide, please, Andrew. Uh, so slight, slight diversion on a culinary theme. So the Bible um, is really designed to be meditated upon. 
Um, we're supposed to read the Bible, and a bit like a, a, a sweet there, a humbug. When you put that humbug in your mouth, you... We're echoing a bit, Luke. Is that all right? I can probably turn it down a bit. Um, thank you. Um, when you suck that sweet, you get sort of different flavours, and you can just enjoy the texture and enjoy the flavour and, you know, savour it. And, and what, that's what we're supposed to do with the Bible. We're supposed to take a passage of the Bible and go over it again and again and savour it and try and extract the flavour and feel the texture and understand um, about that. And then as we do that with the Bible, as we meditate on it, and I know meditation is a very loaded word, but biblical meditation, as we go over that passage, we think about it, we pray about it, we we uh, investigate it. The Bible starts to reveal more and more secrets. And we're supposed to go to the Bible and rather than perhaps sort of understand it academically, we're supposed to let it make us ask questions and try and hunt and investigate and try and turn things over. So that's really what I've been doing this week is most of this sermon has been written probably early in the mornings when I've woken up and I've had a thought and I've just gone with it and I haven't been able to write anything down or read any commentaries and I've just gone over stuff in my mind and meditated and I've had some quite interesting thoughts which I'm going to try and share with you. Um, so verse 20 of all that very long passage right in the middle, that's the key verse that I want us to um, look at. And so um, this is where King Herod, he's... Um, accidentally got John the Baptist killed and beheaded because of an evil scheme. And, um, but it says before that point, it says here that um, Herod feared John the Baptist and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. And when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. And this confusing passage puzzled me, and I wanted to sit there and listen to it and see what it said. Um, So that's really the encouragement today is let's be like Herod, a real baddie, and be prepared to sit with God in his word and be confused by it and be puzzled and then then try and find out some answers and investigate. So we all think Herod's this really bad man, but I think he's in the middle of this passage. He's the, the filling in this sandwich because he's there asking questions and he doesn't understand it. And when I sit in the middle of this passage, I don't fully understand it and I'm asking a lot of questions. So I hope you can do... You can do the same. So, why is this passage like a sandwich? If we could just flick on to the next slide, please, Andrew. Okay, so this passage is technically, according to Bible nerds, called a Markan sandwich. And uh, it's a technique that Mark uses apparently nine times in his Gospel. So you can see Scooby and Shaggy down there with a massive sandwich. That's Mark's Gospel. It's like nine sandwiches stacked all on top of each other. Um, And uh, the point of a Markan sandwich is you get some teaching... Then you, Mark interrupts a story with something completely random and unrelated, and then he goes back to the story. So it's a bit like a slice of bread, and then a filling, and then another slice of bread. And what you're supposed to do is to, to step back and say, why has Mark written it like that? And uh, it's a very strange concept, but believe me, it works. Okay, so last week, Chris, did, without possibly knowing it, and Drew, just flick to the next slide, Chris was preaching on the top slice of bread in our sandwich. And he nudged into the filling a bit, uh, which was interesting. So what happens in that that first slice of bread? You get Jesus, he's he's there in preaching, and his family are there, and he goes, oh, that's the carpenter's boy, he's not, why is he doing all these weird things? And uh, people get very offended by him, and they get get upset. And then it goes on to a story where Jesus, he seems to be doing brilliantly in his ministry, doesn't he? Lots of people are getting excited by Jesus. And then he's starting to get a lot of opposition. And just that point when it seems to be going wrong, Jesus starts to hand over his mission to these 12 disciples who are pretty clueless in all all honesty. And that wouldn't be my strategy. If I was in charge of a business and it it was starting to have a few issues, I wouldn't hand it over to a whole load of people who didn't really know what they were doing. But that's what Jesus starts to do in this passage. He's starting to hand over his ministry and his mission to the disciples who he sends out, he gives them authority and he sends them out to preach and he sends them out to heal and he sends them out to deliver people from demons. And you're thinking, why Mark, why are you explaining this now? This is all very strange. But that's the first part of the sandwich. Okay, so ignoring the filling for a second now, we're gonna go and see what next week we're gonna get. Next week, we're gonna get the bottom slice of the sandwich. So you get this amazing story where 5,000 people get healed So the disciples have come back from starting their ministry and they meet Jesus and Jesus says, we're going to go away 
and then we're going to have to heal, we're going to have to feed 5,000 people. And you feed them, disciples. Work that one out. Then they get in a boat, and uh, they uh, start to go across the water, and it's rough, and Jesus walks past the boat. And the disciples are really terrified. And what does it say here? It says, their minds were closed, and they did not understand about the loaves and the bread. And what's going on here? And then you go to another story where Jesus is beating lots of people, and they all come up and touch him on his clothes, and they all get healed. So that's the two slices of bread. And then you've got in the middle this story about John the Baptist being beheaded, and think, why on earth is that here? Okay, so what I'm going to try and do now is try and explain to you why that filling is here and uh, how it helps us understand what's going on in the, in the rest of the sandwich and why it is a really tasty sandwich. So in the filling, we get a bit of a biography. Um, Herod has had John the Baptist arrested in John chapter 1, verse 18. John's been telling everyone, Jesus is coming, listen to Jesus, he'll baptise you. And then he gets arrested. And you don't hear any more from John. That's chapter 1. And we're in chapter 6 now. And suddenly, Herod hears about all these things that Jesus is doing. And uh, he gets terrified because he's convinced himself that John the Baptist, who is by now dead, is coming back to haunt him. And so he's guilty and he's scared. And in this passage, you get that little starting point about Herod being scared. And then you get the whole backstory. So it's even weirder. You get this filling in the middle of the sandwich with the story about Herod. And then you go off on some other story about why Herod's had John killed. And uh, the point of it is, is that you've got this really guilty king, or we'll called Tetrarch, was his, uh, his, um, his real title, and he's sitting there being really, really sad and, and scared because he's encountered Jesus. And Jesus has shaken him up. And all these stories that we see in the first slice of bread they're getting around and people are getting scared and they're starting to ask questions. And they might come to the wrong conclusion, but like Herod, it wasn't John the Baptist come back to life, it was Jesus who John the Baptist was telling us was going to come. But you've got all these other things going on. You've got a scheming wife who's trying to get Herod to kill John the Baptist because she doesn't like John the Baptist. You've got this terrible feast with all kinds of debauchery going on. And then finally John's head gets cut off. So what is going on? Why does this filling help explain the passage and help unlock the passage for us? And I think it is, it's that verse 20, I think, so I read it earlier, um, I think this is what we want to put ourselves in this situation. It said, Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be righteous and holy. And when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. So I think that's what we're going to do now, is to say what kind of stories would John have told Herod about Jesus and about the, about the kingdom, and what questions would Herod be asking? And that's where the sandwich actually sort of starts to, starts to come into its own. So, um, I think, yeah, Andrew, if you just pop to the, pop to the next slide, please. So, um, actually, no, let's go. Can you, can you flick on two couple of slides, please, Andrew? I'll come back to that one. Yeah, this one, please. Yeah, thank you. Okay, right, so this is me trying to explain what's going on in the sandwich. Okay, so the, so the first column are the questions that Herod was going to be asking. The next column is the stories in the top slice. Then you've got the filling of the sandwich. Then you've got the, the, what are the stories in the second slice, and then what happens later. So what you see is that if you line up the two slices of bread and you have this inquiring Herod in the middle asking questions, the stories actually line up. And you can see that there's a question in the first slice of bread. And then when you get to the second slice of bread, there's either a, set, a similar question or you've got the answer to that question. So that's what John's done. He's stuck you right in the middle of this passage. And he wants us to be asking these questions. Or Mark, sorry, the author Mark. He wants us to be asking these questions. So the first question he probably discussed with Herod was, who is Jesus? So in the first slice of the sandwich, you see that Jesus, oh, he's the carpenter, isn't he? Why is he doing all these amazing miracles? When you get into the next slice, the question, who is Jesus? The question is, is he a ghost? He's walking by. He's passing by. Now that phrase, passing by, is actually an Old Testament reference 
to when God passed by Moses and when he passed by Elijah. So what you're seeing here in the first slice, the question is, who is Jesus? He's the carpenter. The second slice is, is he God? Because he's doing things God does. He passes by, he walks on the water. Let's have a look at another question. So what's happening with the disciples? Andrew, we just flick back to the previous slide, please. So Chris talked about this a bit last week. So what happens? John the Baptist, he's a guy who's come along and he said, Jesus is coming, Jesus is going to do amazing things, he's the Messiah, he's the one who's going to rescue you all. Okay, Jesus comes along and he says, I'm the Messiah, and he points us to the Father, to God. And as I say, in this passage, what we're seeing is that he's starting to hand over that ministry to the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples. And then they, in turn, their ministry will grow and it will become the ministry of the church. And we are now part of that, part of that ministry. So John points to Jesus and he gets killed in this passage. Jesus points to the Father and he gets killed. And now Jesus is handing over his ministry to the 12 apostles. And guess what? 11 of them get killed. John's the only one who doesn't get killed. Oh, and Judas, but then probably his replacement gets killed as well. So, so what you're seeing is this passage is warning us. It's saying there's a big transition going on here. John the Baptist is handing over to Jesus. Jesus is handing over to the disciples. What happens to John is going to happen to Jesus. It's going to happen to the disciples. It's going to happen to the church. So that's another whole stream of questions that you can pick up from these two slices of the sandwich which is another question that Mark, the author, wants us to follow through. So, Andrew, perhaps you can pop through. Thank you. So, the question is, are the disciples hard-hearted? What you see in the first slice of bread is that the apostles are really good. They obey Jesus. They go out and follow his instructions to go and preach and not take anything with them and trust God. looks really good. But then when you get into the second slice and you're looking at disciples, it says... No, they're hard-hearted. They don't understand. They haven't got a clue what's going on. And so again, you can dive into that and start to look across in this passage and say, well, if I'm a disciple, what does that mean? Am I hard-hearted? Do I understand what these stories are telling me? And you can start to investigate and interrogate these stories in the way that Herod did when he talked with John. So I think that's an invitation to us to investigate and interrogate these stories and look at what's going on, what's happening with the miracles, what's happening with the teaching, when I read these passages, these are crazy passages, and yet I read it and go, oh yeah, Jesus does all these amazing things, because I've read it since I was a kid. But if you read this and you've never heard of Jesus, and you've never read the Bible before, this sounds like a movie, it sounds crazy. It can't be true, can it? But it is true, and that's why we're here, we believe it's true. So, follow that question through. Do you believe in the miracles? Do you believe in the fact that God has given us a ministry as a church to reach out to people around us? But I think ultimately the biggest question which this passage asks, and that's why Herod's in here, why Herodias is in here, is actually, do you accept or do you reject Jesus? So Herodias has clearly rejected um, Jesus. She's clearly rejected John the Baptist. He's upset her because he's said, you shouldn't be marrying your brother-in-law and probably her uncle as well. This shouldn't be happening. So she's upset. She wants him killed. That's one reaction to Jesus and his message. He'll offend us. He'll upset us. The other reaction to Jesus' message is what we see in the second slice of bread, is that everybody's coming to Jesus. They're begging to touch him on the cloak so he will heal them. They're absolutely begging him. And everybody who reaches out to Jesus is saved. Everyone who reaches out to touch him is saved. Whereas earlier on in the passage, Jesus doesn't heal a lot of people, only a few when he lays his hands on them. And that's because there's no faith. People don't have rejected him and so he doesn't waste his miracles on them. But because he's good and he loves his kingdom and he wants people to see what his kingdom's like, he reaches out and he touches a few people. But in the second part, everyone reaches out and touches him, and they are all healed. And that's what happens in, there's an amazing verse in um, Joel, when Joel promises the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Joel 2.38 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I think that's where Mark wants us to end up when we finish chapter 6, is everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But some people will call on his name and they will be saved, but some people won't call on his name and unfortunately they will be rejected. So 
That's the sandwich. That's why this weird story of someone having their head cut off and put on a platter is put in the middle of this passage. That's my theory. So, I guess, if the Bible's meditation literature, should we do a little bit of thinking about that? Um, so let's just skip on to the next passage. So there, that's me trying to explain in a diagram. It's not a very good diagram. Um, I need some PowerPoint tips. But what we're seeing here, we see two responses to Jesus, to procl- proclamation of the word, the miracles, and the deliverance ministry. We see people have faith, and they have a holy fear of God. They have a spiritual hunger. They have an expectation of what God's going to do, and they repent and they're humble, and you see the kingdom coming. But if you reject God, you have an unholy fear of God. You're terrified like Herod was, like Herodias was. You have guilt, you have confession, you're offended. You can reject God. Hard hearts, selfish responses, those are responses of rejection. But the good news of the gospel is we all start in the rejection box. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord can move into the faith box and can be saved and can see the kingdom come. But there will be a judgment and uh, people like Herodias will, will receive the judgment for what they, have, what they have done and their rejection of God. So that's Mark chapter 6. And that's why Herod's in the middle. Herod, Herod, Herod wants us to say, which box do you want to be in? And if we all accept we start in the bottom box, Jesus can take us to the top box. That's, that's what I think it's saying. So there's a few questions for us to meditate on today. we just skip on to the next passage. So when we read Mark, beautifully read to us this morning by Annika, the whole chapter, how do we hear it afresh? How do we experience the power of what's going on there, the strangeness of what's going on there? the confusion that we should be feeling when we, when we read it. Are we challenged out of our confusion? And if we are, what will our response be? You know, perhaps we just spend a couple of minutes just being still. Um, I've been really challenged by a verse in Psalm 46. It says, be still. Uh, when, when all the storms are raging, when all the confusion's there, it just says our response to God is to be still and know that he is God. And I think this is an invitation when we read passages like this, just to be still, know that God is God, give our questions to him. Who are you, Jesus? I don't understand anything about what's going on in this passage. What's going on with these miracles? Who do we go to for salvation, healing and deliverance? Do we reach out and touch Jesus or do we reject him? Are we prepared to obey him like the disciples even when we haven't got a clue what is going on? And we'll learn as we go. So let's just spend a couple of minutes, I think, just reflecting, um, just meditating, chewing that sweet over in our, in our mouths, and then I'll close in prayer. I'll just close in prayer. Lord, we uh, thank you that sometimes your Bible is designed to challenge us and confuse us and make us ask difficult questions. And uh, Lord, I pray today that this story of John the Baptist being beheaded, of uh, this king who was strangely interested in John the Baptist, um, Lord, I pray that you help us to sit under these questions, to ponder what, what it is you're saying, to be amazed afresh by these stories and uh, to be transformed I just wanted to, just, there was a, just a list of, the, of, of things. I just wanted to sort of just, as we pray, just, just say so that when, when we do come to Jesus in all our confusion and lacking understanding, these are the kind of things that, that Jesus promises that we will have if we accept his offer of salvation. We're transformed, we're forgiven. We're given new life. We become in Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We're transformed through having new minds. 
God gives us a spirit of power and a sound mind and not of fear. We reflect God, we're his image bearers. And we can go out like the disciples and preach and teach in his power and his authority. And the final thing that came up on my list was we worship. So we say amen now and uh, hand over to Jacques so we can worship and thank Jesus for all that he has done. <laughs>